Hi, my name is Fontaine and I am a Linstrumentalist. Um, yeah, this is my very first Linstrument tutorial. Uh, and it will be the first of a series, a small series of videos that I'm going to be doing in collaboration with my buddy Steve Bernard, who's a very wonderful instrumentalist. And we're hoping to help beginners get off on the right foot, maybe get into improvisation and hoping also to help some more advanced players, give them some food for thought and maybe give them some things to grow with. Um, yeah, so the Linstrument is an instrument that uh, cr was created a few years back by Roger Lynn and Geoff Bavin. And it is, um, it's been something that's been a, a, quite a bit of a revolution in my own, my own musical life. I use it to compose with, I use it to perform with, I use it uh, in the studio as my main tool, basically. Uh, as you see, it's seated here at the hot speed, right where I need to get to it the quickest, yeah. And, uh, you know, my, my experience as a multi-instrumentalist has uh, been really very useful in me getting to, uh, in, my, in my growth on the instrument. And that's kind of what I want to focus on in this video today is, you know, the instrument is an instrument that comes from, it has part stringed instrument DNA, part keyboard instrument DNA, part percussion instrument DNA, part wind instrument DNA. So I, you know, and me being a multi-instrumentalist that really kind of opened up some doors in my mind and allows me to leverage my experience with all of those different instrument worlds and kind of bring them together into one place. And it's been a, a large part of the fundament of my of my musical playing, my my technique and my uh, uh, my approach to playing the instrument. So I want to share some of that with you today, and hopefully that might uh, help you as well. So just to kind of give you a little bit of an overview of where I'm where I'm going to be heading with this video series. Uh, at first, I want to concentrate on uh, the multi instrument heritage of the instrument. Um, how you might approach it if you're coming from a guitar background, how you might approach it if you're coming from a keyboard background, how you might approach it if you're coming from a percussion background and so on, and how to kind of take advantage of your experience um, with any of those instruments and how, how to apply that to you know, moving forward with the instrument. In the second, series, second video of the series, I would like to present an approach of mine that I call the eight-fingered hand. And in the third video, I would like to present an expansion of that that I call the finger zone technique. And we're gonna, one thing I wanna say about this whole series is that I don't really look at this as, I don't look at these as lessons per se. Uh, this is my own personal approach. There are many ways to approach the instrument. And that's one of the things about it. It's such a new instrument that there's no real methodology uh, there's no real wrong or right way to approach it, to play it. You, some There are people who play it, you know, in an upright position like it's a guitar or like it's a Chapman stick or as a keyboard like I do. Um, so I don't really want to put this out there that my way is the only way or the best way. But I, but there were a lot of people asking, there have been a lot of people asking the last year or so for me to present um my way of doing things and that's what I really that's really all I want to do and hopefully that will help uh, some of you players um, yeah advance so um, with that being said I'm going to probably set up the camera so we can get an overhead view and uh, we're going to talk about some things like the layout of the instrument and what that means how what kind of impact that has on how we approach it all right okay so here we are I just want to take a quick look at the layout of the instrument um, and that's just to kind of uh, to once again showcase the the mixed DNA of the instrument and what uh, and how that is visually uh, um, becomes visually apparent yeah when we take a look at it so for those of you who don't know and I'm pretty sure most of you watching the video do know uh, the instrument uses in its default setting, it uses the fourths layout. Some call it the chromatic fourth, some call it the, you know, string, st uh, string fourths layout or whatever. So basically what we've got here is we've got, if we imagine the rows of the instrument, 
as strings and we imagine the columns as frets. Um, this gives us ascending half tones going from left to right and ascending fourths going from bottom to top, okay? Um, basically, this is exactly how a bass guitar is tuned. As a matter of fact, you could even view <laughs> the instrument as a big eight-string bass guitar, right? So, um, so that already is the, the most apparent part of its of its DNA is this stringed instrument heritage. Yeah, uh, for me, this is great personally because I started studying the contrabass in my adolescence and have played it for, for ever since then. Um, so for me, the visual cues, whenever, whenever I'm thinking of music, you know, in uh, chordal or, or interval, intervallic ways of visualizing music, the first thing that pops up in my mind is this layout, basically. So for me personally, it's great. It's like home, you know. But there are some other advantages that I think uh, uh, that the fourth layout has. And I think that it it um, makes it a lot easier in general, whether you have a string instrument background or not, to visualize the inherent geometry of music theory. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's a reason that we use the cycle of fourths and fifths to kind of you know, to uh, represent the, the heart of the Western musical system. And this is this is becomes a, definitely more apparent when you actually start to look at the layout of the instrument, at least that aspect of it. Now, going on to another part of its DNA, um, the, at least the way I have mine set up here is that I have the lights um, reflecting certain notes, yeah? And those notes would be, so right here where I have the highlighted uh, notes in green, those are C, and the blue notes are the natural notes of a C major scale. This is the layout that many of you probably are very familiar with. And the black or unilluminated um, notes or pads are the uh, black keys on the piano. So there's already a visual reference to here that kind of reflects the keyboard aspect of it. Now, if we were to, um, for example, I'm going to use some old school visualization methods here, just use some construction paper and just kind of block out the most of, just expose one row here. This is where we see the instruments, you say the keyboard linear uh, uh, part of the the, the the instrument DNA. Now, starting here, once again, taking the, the, the green dots are C. We've got C, D, E, F, G, A, B, and C. All right? So, I mean, it actually has both keyboard and guitar integrated into it already kind of automatically yeah by default now this is this is going to be useful a useful a bit of information to have it seems it seems overly obvious i know but being able to adjust your playing to uh to switch into either a more keyboard way of approaching it or a more guitaristic way of approaching it is going to be really useful later so i'm just going to throw that out there right now okay so this layout i mean already from the beginning we see that it gives us a way to work along the horizontal axis and it gives us a way to to work along the vertical axis now if you're coming from a guitar background more than likely you're going to be thinking of playing across the strings this is something that we do as in the guitar world you're voicing chords, for example, or playing melodies. Going, traversing across the strings, okay? Now, in the keyboard world, <laughs> because we don't have the, the uh, advantage of having inharmonic notes, there's only one middle C 
on a piano keyboard, right? So that's in one position on the keyboard. And of course, there are the octaves, yeah, in this case. But there's no traveling on a long vertical axis to, 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 get, uh, to get the same note. Yeah. Yeah. So this is this is might be a little a, something a, a bit of a hurdle at first for keyboard players to have to start thinking about moving their chord structures. I mean, you could obviously you could play a C major chord like this. You know, it's totally doable. But as you see, it's a little bit clumsy. I, f I feel that I feel that it's it it kind of negates the natural hand position that you can that you can achieve by playing this instrument from above. Yeah. So um, one thing that, like I said, keyboard players are going to have to get used to is maybe making use of the stringed heritage of the instrument. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and now that might seem like, I don't want to say, I want to call it a disadvantage. It might be something, definitely something that you're going to need to get used to as a keyboard player voicing across. But there is something that's built in, a, a big advantage that's built into the instrument that guitar players are going to have to get used to, guitar string instrument players are going to have to get used to, and that is being able to actually voice or, to, you know, to play multiple notes on one string. Yeah, for example. That would be totally physically impossible to do on a stringed instrument for obvious reasons. You can't play more than one note on a string at a time. And that's why we voice things, voice things across strings, yeah? Um, and this is, this, is, this, is a, this is a big thing because um, it allows you to kind of split up the work, in, at least when you're doing chordal, when you're doing voicing things, and in interesting ways and allows you to voice things in different interesting ways for example this obviously i've got the e and the d so i'm getting a, a, a nine thing going in there i also have it up here voiced again a nine and that's just not even possible on on a guitar yeah so a lot of advantages there as well. Basically, getting at is I think if you're coming from a guitar as you know, from you know from a guitar background, a stringed instrument background, uh, then you know you need to start looking at the key, looking at the fingerboard more as a keyboard type instrument and what advantages that can bring to you. And if you're a keyboard player, start looking at the stringed instrument heritage of the instrument and looking, looking to see what kind of advantages that can bring to your playing as well. My suggestion is, you know, if you're practicing something like the C major scale, then practice it both ways. And practice it in the more traditional piano way. For example. Okay, so so that you are not limiting yourself to playing things in only one way, because there's more than one way to skin the cat. Yeah, you know. So there's that will just give you maximum flexibility as far as when it comes to soloing, playing melodies, playing chords. Just get your both of your hands used to playing things in both variations: a keyboard-oriented variation and a stringed instrument-oriented variation. It's going to be a big help for you later. Okay, now going back to uh, some things that, concern, things that might be of concern or at least uh, uh, something to pay attention to when you're coming to the Lynn from a guitar or bass background is, you know, normally when you're a guitar or bass player, you, you're used to playing the guitar like this, right? You can see that. And your thumb is... It plays a very important role. I mean, it's the whole kind of pivot or anchor to your to your left hand. Um, when you're playing, obviously, in a more keyboard oriented position, it takes on a different role. It's still it's still very much your anchor. Mm -hmm. 
but it becomes an active note playing component to your hand. Okay. So that's something that you practice that. Yeah. Put some time into, into integrating your thumb into your playing both hands. Obviously this is going to be important, especially when I get to the third video, when I talk about the finger zone technique, um, we're going to see what that, what, what advantages that's going to have. So, um, I'm going to move along now. So yeah, um, practice, there's no way around it. So if you, especially when you want to, uh, when you want to gain the dexterity necessary to play things like this, you know, principles were being used, you know, as far as like sometimes using the, the, the right hand to do kind of more pianistic things, the left hand to do guitaristic things, um, the dexterity involved to play the, the, some of the more, you know, the, some of the faster things, which kind of brings me to the next thing I'd like to underline. It's kind of in the DNA of the instrument. And that's, it's kind of percussive. It's DNA as a, uh, coming from the world of percussion and particularly finger drumming. So, um, take a look at this. Oh, whew. it's cold out today. So I'm in my car and you might be asking yourself, Fontaine, what are you doing in your car? Well, I know I'm kind of freezing my butt off because it's cold, but you know, I, you know, being a professional musician, uh, I spent a lot of time traveling around, driving to gigs, driving to studios. I spent a lot of time in my car, uh, and it's been going on for many a decade. So I'm a pretty experienced driver, pretty responsible driver, but I do have a, a small tick or two when it comes to driving. And one of them is, uh, whenever I'm at like, you know, and sitting in traffic and I'm sitting at the turn, the turn lane and, you know, I have the blinker on like that, I get this compulsion to finger drum on my steering wheel. Am, am I the only one who does that? I don't think so, but you know. You know, and so on. Drives my passengers absolutely bonkers. Uh, but it, like I said, it's compulsive, it just happens. And, um, you know, I've had people ask me how to build up dexterity when playing the instrument. And I say, you know, there's, you have plenty of opportunities even when you're away from the instrument to work on your finger drumming techniques. This is how I do it. <laughs> or if you're at a table at a restaurant, you drive people absolutely crazy. It doesn't matter. As long as you're getting your chops up and you, you know, you're moving forward, then it's a good thing, you know? So, uh, this is how, this is like I said. You can do all sorts of things. I like doing it with the with the uh, with the uh, blinker because it acts as a metronome for me. I'm just sitting here instead of wasting my time cussing out the people in front of me, you know, because they're not moving fast enough. I can just chill, get my little beats going, practice, you know, polyrhythms, all sorts of great stuff. You know, so as you can see, um, the instrument can be a very percussive instrument. And not only for the finger drumming, but the, the, the dexterity and the, the idea of applying 
you know these rhythm these beats and rhythms to you know to the instrument that you can that can also be expanded into when you're using you know doing chordal playing or melodic playing you know i'm just going to try it off the cuff once again off the top of my head i'm going to come up with a groove just kind of underline that okay <laughs> Okay, well, those were just a few ways that uh, you might be able to apply your knowledge coming from another instrument to uh, making music with the Linstrument, and I hope that that was useful for you. Um, I'd also like to say, though, that a lot of the concepts we were talking about today can easily be transferred to pretty much any grid-based instrument, be it the Akai Force, the Ableton Push, the Novation Launchpad, Medusa. Now, but the thing is that the Linstrument has a very, very special and deep set of, uh, of functionality that allows it to uh, be a far more expressive instrument. And that's something we want to get into in later videos. Um, now, if you like what you saw, please like, subscribe, make some comments about how maybe we can also uh, expand on some of the things we were talking about today, if I don't get to them in later videos. And uh, don't forget to subscribe to Steve Bernard's channel and check out his videos because we're going to link his videos and my videos as well to Roger Lynn's tutorials playlist where you can find it a little bit easier. So um, yeah, that's about all I have for now. So please, once again, like and subscribe and we'll see you in the next video. Take care.